So I know we're welcome to section two of the podcast, all about being there. So, Awuka, you've already kind of talked about a lot of um, life in these amazing places you've lived, um, in so many places that you've lived. Um, but first of all, can we kind of go back to first moving away from Europe to South America? What was your kind of initial impressions when you first arrived? Um, I definitely had um, the culture shock. I remember it well. Um, now it's harder to get it because I just expect things to be very different. Um, but back then when I arrived, it was like I was very, very stressed. Um, at first, like I was over, like was overly excited and everything was amazing because it was new and I was away. And also I was traveling for the first time alone. I was 23 and I was in Latin America. And in Germany, they tell you all kinds of things about it. And you have so many um, um, stereotypes. No, that's not the... Yeah, not, stereotypes not, would be it. Well, no, no, stereotypes not the more negative. Prejudice. Yes, yes. So it's it's because of the movies and like and like colleagues and friends and people I'm like not friends with anymore. But they were like, oh, it's so dangerous as a woman. And how can you go there? And people are being kidnapped and like all this. Uh, silly things but they're because they watch too many um, American movies uh, where the Mexicans are always the bad guys so um, that was like but I I always was like like I knew I knew better so because I had friends there I met people and it's like you, you just a lot of people don't manage to think outside of their, their bubble or their box and they're they're living in but still, it was scary for me being there alone for the first time traveling and being a woman. And I don't know, I had, I didn't know anyone there apart from this group that I was going to meet at some point. So after one week, I was just so exhausted and tired and like really stressed. And I locked myself for three days in my room. I was um, renting a room. I was supposed an Airbnb. Um, I made friends with the the girl who lived there at some point. That was helpful, but she only spoke Spanish, no English, and I didn't speak Spanish, so it was it was going slow. But yeah, I locked myself in that room, and I was wondering why, why, what's going on? Didn't I, did I take my my demons with me, and and now I'm just having them here? And I thought all kinds of things, and I was just there. I couldn't leave, and was so exhausted. And then I realized that I was just having a culture shock. It was too much new stuff, too many things so different, the language, the way people are. And it was, yeah, overwhelming. But without me realizing, I found everything exciting and amazing. And yay, I want to meet people. And I had conversations in my, yeah, with my basic Spanish. I re Now everything feels very normal. And it's very safe. Um, also, as a woman, it's like it's the same thing. If you travel to maybe Berlin, um, it's like the typical things you have to to be aware of. Like, don't walk around at ten a.m. at ten a.m. ten p.m. after ten p.m. as a woman with your phone like this. Hello, and you know it. It's like common sense. So you just have to be careful. Um, so after a while, um, I was also feeling calm about that. And yeah, it's, I think the way I felt called culture shock was through exhaustion, being overly excited. Yeah, I think exhaustion is, is probably quite, especially if it's a, if it's a new language, can be quite common because your brain is working overdrive or you, you haven't got the comfort of seeing something which is, which comes, you know, like naturally to you like if you be obviously reading german um if you're not exposed to that at all in, in your day <laughs> it can be quite quite difficult because your brain is constantly having to translate something or you're on your phone or having to do it an extra step basically in order to function in everything you're doing just adds that extra 30 percent of your energy is gone so yeah and also the way people are like the, the the culture itself it's so different um it i don't know if in i'm 
in the UK it's similar, but it takes a while until a German invites you to to the house um, or wants to spend a lot of time with you when you just met. Um, but there, Santiago, after arriving, I met so many people who just knew my name, where I came from. We talked three sentences and they already invited me to um, go on a trip to some village and stay in a cabin with a group of friends. And you know, so we, I went traveling with strangers and, and, and people were inviting me for dinner to the house. And, and it was, um, they were all women. So I wouldn't go with a strange, uh, guy to the, to the house or on a trip or something. So it was a group, group of, um, women and they were friends and they said, Hey, you should, you should join us. And there was one girl, she was owning, um, a diving school. And then she was inviting me to do that, but I was too afraid back then to do that. Um, yeah. And that's not, that's not what I'm used to. I constantly being around people. And I, ne I didn't have a moment for myself and I need a lot of me time, but in that, I didn't know. And I didn't know there, it was like today we go in there and then on this weekend, um, yeah, we go in on a trip and then we rented a cabin. We want to join. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's join. And then, oh, what are you going to do after school in the afternoon? We're going to go hiking to that random hill. You want to join? Uh, okay. <laughs> What are you doing for dinner? Like my my parents they are cooking um, a special Chilean dish that you should try and um, yeah okay <laughs> so that was never ending yeah and it was it was it's amazing it's beautiful how open people are but it was overwhelming for me and later after, when I started living here with a Chilean and his family around. That's when I really, really felt it, the differences in culture. I always thought I'm not like a typical German, like I'm, I'm like so far away. But then I realized that I'm still quite German, so maybe, maybe less now and um, so strict anymore. But there were certain things that Germans do that I didn't know was part of being German. But then I discovered, I discovered it that yeah, yeah, you. You are German. There's no, no <laughs> walking away no, from that. No hiding it. <laughs> yeah, something a lot of Germans say to me, like, "We don't have a culture. Germany is so boring. German culture is boring because it doesn't exist." But it's not true. But I thought the same way. I thought there's nothing special. But but I guess I, you have to leave in order to find it. Right. Same in the UK. Like obviously, we are we are. A joke of our our food isn't really a culture. Uh, we we haven't got a cuisine. It's just piss and chips. Or uh, <laughs> I was just I was just thinking like, wait, do I know? <laughs> yeah, oh, fish and chips. <laughs> but to be fair, I I never I I have only been to the to the UK once for two hours, and that's it. So I can't believe. The same in in Germany, I guess. All I know Germany is for is sausage or wurst, <laughs> various types of wurst. And pretzels, yeah. but then I I I learned yeah. about um uh rouladen and everything oh, else. So. Rouladen, yeah. Oh, everything yeah. meat, of course. Yeah. Quite a difficult place, Jerry, to 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 be vegetarian. I mean, now there you can, you just cannot eat typical German dishes. Um, by now, like that's also something that absolutely blew my mind when I came back to Germany. To, like, it, I I had a difficult time being vegan. Um, I'm like, I have an on off relationship with being vegan because sometimes I eat cheese. Um, but are we so quite similar? It's, 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 it's so I, I can, but, um, I, it was hard for me cause I have uh, most very limited, but now there are so many vegan products in Germany. That's ridiculous. You don't have to eat meat at all. Like even my brother who did, who used to hate vegetables and only eat meat. He eats meat like maybe once or twice a week now because there are so many other options. And he's curious, like, oh, what's that vegan schnitzel? What does it taste like? I'm curious. So he he buys it and eats it and thinks, oh, that, that's so good. Tastes good. So he buys it again instead of the real schnitzel. So, um, 
Yeah. But what were we talking about? <laughs> when you went back home then after the, the first stint, I suppose, abroad, what was the, the culture shock when you got back? Obviously, you said before you arrived back and you started school and then was like, nope, I'm not doing this anymore. And went, went, went again. Um, what, was, was there a, a number of things which caused that or was it just the fact that you didn't want your heart was somewhere else? Now, but when I, I came just back after three months, or was it four? I'm not sure anymore. So I wasn't enough, I wasn't really away yet to have this distance between me and, and the country and what I'd been through. And so the culture shock wasn't there. I was just coming back and like, oh, it's all the same. But then when I left, I stayed away for five years and I haven't set a foot in Europe in five years. I was only from Asia or Latin America. Um, I also hadn't seen my parents, my siblings. None of them could visit me because you know, COVID, uh, social strike. It wasn't my sister planned to visit me in Costa Rica, but then it didn't work out because then she had a baby. So I didn't see anyone. And quite selfish uh, yeah it's it's uh after five years you see, I think you notice things um I didn't notice before that for example I realized Germany or northern Germany is like I'm from the north so I'm from a city close to Hamburg and I used to live in Hamburg for seven years it's like well I was a cop in Hamburg um and I came back and I felt like a tourist. It was so interesting. There were so many things that I noticed that felt familiar, but at the same time new. They were old, but new to me because I haven't noticed before. Or I was I was a million times there, but I've never seen that there's like a, a beautiful tunnel. And then there were patterns and art on the wall and... And uh, things that I ha- like, those things that I haven't seen, like I, I've, so- I've seen them before, but not really, you know, and I was walking, taking pictures and all, oh, all oh, this is, and then typical random things like uh, we eat in the north. Um, that's like so typical for Hamburg and for northern Germany, eating um, a bread with fish in it, like a special pickled type of fish in bread. So we call it fish, fish brötchen, <laughs> if you want to speak northern German. So that was my special accent. Um, and that's that's culture. That's culture. Like there is German culture, like this type of food, and then their the the way like they they dress people on the coast and the way they speak. That there's actually that I had a dialect. I didn't really feel it until I went abroad and then I met sometimes other Germans and then they were say, oh you're from the north <laughs> can you hear that I don't know so I noticed like positive things that were nice um interesting uh about where I came from um and that Hamburg is pretty it's a pretty city actually really beautiful and at first I had hate like I didn't I was like ah so I don't like the city and I came back, and now I think it's so beautiful. Like, wow! <laughs> and then the Wait. the city center and has this beautiful lake, and I just couldn't see it because I was from there. Um, so that was like, yeah, wow, <laughs> a, an experience, a shock, also. When you moved to China, what was that? What was that like? Because obviously, Eastern Asia is. Um, a lot different to Latin America and Europe. Mm-hmm. How, how did you find that when you first moved? Difficult. Um, yeah, I found I found it hard to make friends there with Chinese um, people you know, because of the language mainly. But I I, I mentioned it because I felt as it seemed to me that they were quite shy when in a conversation with me and trying to get out of it quickly maybe also just didn't like me at all <laughs> um i had colleagues there um and it was like 
oh, we were only speaking the um, the necessary. And whenever I tried to get into like small talk to kind of, I wanted to make friends with people, of course, and somehow get into the society. But it was more like, yeah, no, I don't want I just want to, let's just work. Let's just book some work and, and that's it. And they wouldn't share anything private. So I worked with like for six months with the same people. I didn't know anything about them, just their names. Um, but that changed later when I, I worked in a different school and then they spoke English also, um, a bit. So, and that's why I said like, if, and I think it's because of the language barrier that they wouldn't want to engage so much, so much with me or, but then the ones who spoke English or like briefly, they were talking to me and sharing also private things, not much. I just just the about they they have children and what they did last weekend, but it wasn't it wasn't so easy to get really closer to any of my colleagues. Um, what helped was meeting locals in the bar <laughs> because they were not so shy anymore. <laughs> so I, I eventually I may see, <laughs> yeah. I made friends later uh, with locals um, when I met them in a bar, and then we would hang out. We would hang out, but I never managed to make friends with my colleagues in school. It was just, I don't know. I tried, but then when I okay, let's just be, you know, let's just talk about work. So it was hard. I felt a bit lonely um, at times. Um, we wouldn't because we were working so much. I was working during the week and on weekends. So I wouldn't see my husband often and. And he had it easier to make friends because he's also an extrovert. And I I might seem very outgoing right now, and but I'm not in real life. <laughs> like I'm, shy, I'm a shy and it's harder for me to um, engage in social uh, in like interactions and be like the first person who says something. So I'm more, I wait for people to say hi to me first. So that's hard when you're surrounded by people who are also waiting for you to say hi first. <laughs> so that was um, the complete opposite of Chile, my experience in Chile. It took several months until I had some friends that were local. I made friends with foreigners quick, but with Chinese people from Beijing, it was it took a while. Eventually it worked, but... Um, Everything was cheaper, so food was amazing. So if it switched from making friends to food, I loved it. It was heaven. I love Chinese food, especially Beijing food. It's not the same in different parts of China. Uh, they have their own stuff. Um, but Beijing has... A, uh, maybe for people who are from Beijing, think like, oh, but this is so boring, but I really like this food. And you go to the supermarket and the supermarket, there are some like booths who would sell um, like lunch that is quick, like random lunch, some fried uh, eggplants with soy and rice. <laughs> and it was, I loved it so much. Like I loved going there and eating in those supermarket booths and all uh, soup places, um, street food. Uh, that was I loved it. Um, and uh, what I also noticed that was a little bit annoying was that it was really, really loud. On like on the street, on the on on the market, if you want to buy something, like in the in the mall, everything was really loud. Like they were speaking really loud, and they were making music in speakers, and the speakers were always always too loud. And I was always wondering about that, like why, why so loud? Um, and then in when you go inside a, a mall, and then they have music and the normal speakers and ads, and always so loud that I had to go with earpads. It was, it was, I couldn't. So I don't know. And I, I also noticed when I talked to my colleagues that they were speaking really loud. Um, but I can also just be me, really, really sensitive, but. Um, that was also different. And then, um, 
you mentioned you started your online work whilst living in China. How did you find that? What was what was the what was the drive for that? What was the incentive and and how did you find starting work whilst whilst being in China? I didn't want to teach English anymore because I didn't feel very qualified to do that. Um, at some point, I mean, I wasn't really speaking fluent enough to teach it. I was able to teach basic English, so it was fine, but it wasn't my calling. So um, I felt uncomfortable. So I stopped and I started at first teaching again online. Um, so I was teaching the parents of the kids I was teaching online. Um, and that's when I started. That was the I without a contract or anything. I didn't have this business mindset yes, I, yet. I was just, um, yeah, and now I teach online and by myself and I teach the parents or I make those connections and started teaching adults. Um, and that's how I got into this, into this online world. But that transitioned very fast when I discovered um, what I'm, but where I were actually, or what I was actually good at. Yeah, but in China, it was really easy to just transition because of the network, starting teaching business at first. Incredible. And then you, did you carry that kind of forward everywhere you've lived then? You're still doing the same kind of work? Uh, no, um, I was, we were leaving China and then we were traveling in um, to Thailand, Japan, and here and there, <laughs> just traveling. And I was still teaching, but then when we arrived in Chile and like one month after arriving, the social strike started. I, that was like, I had a lot of time and I was always, you know, quite good with things, <laughs> things online and with starting, I didn't want to teach anymore. Uh, so I stopped it and I transitioned into virtual assistance. So I started a virtual assistant business and um, helping people with administration of their online businesses. Um, but only after like two months, two or three months, I um, found myself in a managing position like for operations management. And that's where I said in the beginning, I understand the, the techie nerdy thing <laughs> because I, I got so deep into what makes, um, what makes a business really run and what makes it run by itself like without human interaction necessarily like small tasks that you could delegate to someone or you could just automate it how can i make the back end of an online business optimize it um so i would look at people's businesses and see how their tech setup is and then recommend better setups and implement them and run them and so i found myself at some point without knowing being an operations manager managing teams, managing the systems, building processes. And then at some point I heard that what I was doing was being an online business manager. Um, so I got certified in, in doing that and put, got a mentor and like really went for it and learned what I um, didn't know yet, specialized in it. And that's what I've been doing since then. Like I, well, all this time when I was traveling, living in Costa Rica, Mexico and everything, I run other people's businesses. Like I'm like the powerhouse um, behind the scenes. <laughs> so, and that was in the end really my calling because then I can geek out about stuff and they, things that they don't have time for, or they don't care about, they just want things to work somehow without spending too much money or spending too much time on it. Um, so then they need people like me who, who actually love doing that. Um, and I help them hiring and I hire virtual assistants. I have people in my team who are VAs and they, they do those things. And that's, it was perfect. It uh, worked really well together with this lifestyle. Like being a nomad, a lot of people wonder, how can I have this lifestyle and make money? How, how is that possible? And it is possible by... Either yeah, teaching English, for example, that's really classic, but not everybody can do it or wants to do it. Um, and then there are other options like selling services online, transferable services from a previous job, for example. Like I was, I was a cop. That's not much where you can say this is transferable. I cannot offer this online. But what I learned is confidence there. 
um, systems, the appreciating organization, like back end structure and, and those things and showing up confidently, even though I wasn't feeling that way. Um, so I can convince myself of something until I believe it. So I can give myself a pep talk and it would work because that's what I was doing when I was scared and afraid and didn't know what was going on. And, and I gave myself a pep talk. And that's something I do now and made me build this business that serves me now because I can just, you know, <laughs> that's something positive, something good I could take from there. And now allows me to have this lifestyle and probably the one thing that I would re recommend people to do first um, when they want to live abroad as a nomad and don't know how is um, starting, a, starting your own business and building it on your own terms. As a VA, for example, because that's um, easy to, to, enter the, to enter this world. Now, that's some incredible advice and I'm sure hopefully people listening will be inspired by your story and, and, and want to live and work and, and do BA probably first. I dare to speak to another person who does virtual assistance as well. Um, it seems to be quite the common route in initially and then you can expand from that really. Um, going going back to kind of uh, your life to live or living abroad or being there, uh, um, out of curiosity, the countries within South America, how did they compare for you? I know obviously it's it's a huge place and there's so many different climates and um, but for as a European, I'm quite ignorant. So I'd, I'd love to get your first hand experience of of your uh, how you feel though the cultures uh, uh, vary throughout throughout the continent. Well, obviously they have all a lot of things in common since they speak the same language, but at the same time, it's not really the same language because they all, and it may be, not sure if you can, if it's similar in English, if there's so big differences, um, but there are a few words that maybe Americans would say that maybe in, in in the UK you would never use or you don't even know about. I feel like when I lived abroad, I was the ambassador for British English because everyone in Sweden was speaking American English because of Netflix and uh, popular media. Everyone learns American English. Uh, and in Southeast Asia, people probably learn Australian English. Um, they're wrong. They're not English. I've heard that before. My Chinese students, actually, they wanted to learn American English because of movies. So they were fans of all this stuff. So I, think I was trying to teach myself an American accent. Back then, I was watching speak English with, what was the name? I don't know, like some YouTube girl who speaks American English. So she was teaching how to have an American accent. And then I was watching that and trying to imitate. <laughs> so I could teach that to my students. <laughs> Uh, so it was, that must be funny for you. And then you, I had also in China mostly American friends. So they were, the only person who was British was from Ireland and people were saying that that's not English. I mean, so. they'd hate you to call them English as well. Uh, sorry, yeah, it was about the variation in uh, in kind of culture throughout South America. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we end up talking about English. <laughs> yeah. So, um no, yeah, it's like first of all, it's the it's the language that makes them have all something in common, and at the and then at the same time not. Um, so they all have like from the countries I travel to, and then people I met from the the countries because I only travel to Mexico, Costa Rica, Argentina, and Chile. Um, so I haven't really like I've been in Colombia one day, but that doesn't count. But I do know people from Colombia, from Venezuela, from Ecuador, from like all kinds of places. Um, so um, I get I get the, the, the feeling, I, I'd say, or I dare to say, that this, um, what they all have in common is being very like social, like very social, they like to socialize. 
um, a lot and having this um, inviting people to your home or making friends with the neighbors fast and um, barbecuing and having like doing a lot with the family like strong family bonds um, that I feel have they have all in common as well as being more a bit more laid back than from what I know in Germany I feel that was one of the first things I noticed that people that were in general a little bit happier like or maybe maybe not really happy but able to smile over things um like one example is in in Chile when when they make fun of things that are terrible like they make a lot of jokes about earthquakes for example and and a lot of things happen like when when an earthquake happened that's awful like, like that's terrible but they never know when the next one is going to happen and what also my when i talked about this with my husband i think like how people are always like one day something terrible happens and next day they're already laughing and and playing jokes about it and making memes and stuff like that he said that's some the only way to cope with this because if you're always like be taking it so seriously all the time you live in constant fear and that's not fun. So they're like taking things a bit more easy. Like, hey, you know, it's, it reminds me of this song. Um, I don't know what's called. It's always look on the bright side of life. You know, it's not that. <laughs> and, and that's the vibe I'm getting here. Um, and from in any country, especially also in Costa Rica, by the way, people were so like, oh, I lost all my money yesterday. But, you know. The another opportunity for something will ha happen tomorrow. Who knows? Who knows what's gonna happen? You know, one day one door closes, another one will open. So just take it easy. So that's that was the kind of I'm exaggerating a bit, but that's the kind of vibe I got, um, and that's I feel they have all in common. That's the uh, yeah, that's a great outlook to have in life. I think a lot of people are becoming more like that. I think in even even in Europe, but especially younger generations are starting to think more. Of, so what you know, we we don't need to work in the same company for thirty years and do the same job. We can have several careers. We can we can vary a lot of things. We have a lot more choice um, out there, and you can you can just go and and travel. You can just go and um, you know quit your job or or not not to buy a house or family when you're 30 or whatever um it it's not it's not a norm or it shouldn't be the norm anymore um which is quite interesting to 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 see and yeah just in, enjoy what you want to do first rather than i think the egg the the go-to as for my parents generation as well was to work work as hard as you can and then retire and then have fun whereas now it's like well now i want to have fun now I don't know if I were trying. I don't know if I'd get that far. Why would I get it all on getting to 60 and then be having fun? Why could I have fun in my 20s and 30s? And... Exactly. Yeah, that's that shit happened while I was gone. So when I came back, I was um, also very like, whoa, what is this? <laughs> I'm, I'm not used to it. I was like, I mean, it's good. I like this. Um, I'm, I think... I, a lot of a lot of millennials don't like Gen Z, but I am a huge fan. I love them. So um, that was a development that I noticed so much that was so strong when I came back. I was like, wow, that's uh, so different. I like it. That's nice. So let's make friends. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's nice um, to, to see this development. Um, I mean, that's, that's again... Um, noticing that is great and then taking like taking advantage of this is great too that's but still like some not something people most people can cannot do here like maybe maybe in Chile but it's that's like a, a privilege that we has have as Europeans like noticing that and then do something about it like here um, oftentimes um, even if they didn't, I mean, if they wanted, like lots of people just couldn't um, just travel um, because it's 
it's just that it's a different world. But even if you come from a background with more limited resources, um, where you would think, well, if you have this, then maybe you would be sadder or whatever. Like that was my thinking in the beginning. Um, but it wasn't that way. It was like, even though like when I, when I was with people who were just, just had that, their community in that is, and they were so happy about it. And still was thinking so big. There was one girl in Costa Rica that I met. Um, she was um, cleaning the houses of almost every villager there in that little village I was living. Um, and she was uh, 31 years old and she had a son. And she was give, getting paid in cash. And she said, I'm saving everything because I want to buy a house here. And I want to rent it to a tourist so that I can travel the world. And then she was like determined just to do that. And in the meantime, you know, I don't stress about it. She worked maybe four hours a day, um, went out with her, with the other villagers at the end of the day and, you know, relaxing, chilling, not hustling. Like she worked, did her part, but saved everything. And she had her dream and she, she had their goal, but without working herself out. So then it takes long, okay, um, but I'm getting there. And I found it so, like, it's different. Like, I never had this mindset. It's like either you work your ass off for reaching your goals, you know, or, or like, even if you reach your goals already, you're still working your ass off because then you think you don't deserve having that without constantly working, like being in hustle mode. So it's, you know, it's... Yeah, like I know she's gonna get there. Like she or she shared how much she saved with me, you know. So you can already buy a, a house. You say, yeah, but I wanna save a little bit more before I go for it. So she's gonna get there, but with this chill attitude from the beginning, and she's gonna arrive there. She's happy, and she's gonna be still happy, and it may be happier, or maybe just the same all the times, you know. And that maybe another form of culture shock. Um, be stressing out about so many things. Is there anything else you want to add uh, about <laughs> living in all these amazing places? I appreciate we've been going for nearly an hour. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I, I could talk about it for five more hours if you let me, <laughs> but maybe it's too much. <laughs> well, perfect. We can end in section two there and go on to kind of your review of the time and some, some advice. <laughs>